Okay, uh, we are on time. So thank everyone to attend this presentation. I'm pleased to, to introduce Michael. He's going to present the role to volume populators. Uh, he's going to talk about creating persistent uh, covert disk, the past, present, and future. Thank you, Michael. It's on you now. Thank you, Marcelo. <clears throat> hey, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Um, those of you on the US East, I hope you are. In um, this will be a good presentation to eat lunch too, I hope. Okay, um, so the road to volume populators, creating persistent convergence past, present, and future. Um, so this presentation is basically about the fact that Qbert CDI will be supporting uh, volume populators for initializing your Qbert disks. Um, how does this compare to the existing data volume API? And you know what to do about that? You know what's the future for both of these things, volume populators and data volumes? And hopefully, um, we'd like to get some ideas from you in the community. Right. So a bit um, back in the beginning of the Kubert project. Uh, you know, uh, we're basically running virtual machines in Kubernetes. Uh, virtual machines are typically stateful workloads. You, you know, if you stop your VM and start it back up, you probably want the same data that was there when you stopped it. So, so stateful workloads in Kubernetes means persistent volume claims. But persistent bond claims are initially empty and hypervisors need something. They need uh, disk image files or they need devices that look like disk that look like disks that basically have operating system files that you can boot from. So the problem is how can persistent volume claims be safely populated with disk images before being consumed by a hypervisor? So that's that's kind of the problem statement that we had a couple of years ago. Thing we considered was init containers. Um, so, uh, for those who don't know, you know, Kubernetes VMs run in pods. Uh, one, the main container is running basically QMU with your virtual for your virtual machine to communicate with KVM on the host. Blah blah blah. Uh, pods can have init containers. So, init containers run before the main container. Theoretically, we could. Um, do whatever we want to do in these init containers. We could populate them at that point and have everything ready for QMU. And um, that was explored, but it was kind of not a great match, uh, a little awkward. I mean, when you configure your virtual machine, you create, we have a virtual machine CRD, we have a virtual machine instance CRD. Um, you know, init containers are things on pods. Um, what if you have a bunch of them? Yeah, you know, images. It, it, it's a little awkward. Um, and the other thing that was made them a little tough to deal with was the fact that we want basically this population phase. We want this PVC to initialize to be initialized once, the first time the VM is started or the first time the volume is used. So init containers didn't seem like a great match. Enter data volumes. So. We needed something. Um, again, this was a while ago, and um, we figured that creating our own custom resource would be the best way to go, at least at that point in time. Um, so we created this data volume abstraction. It has essentially two jobs. Uh, the first is to create a PVC per your configuration. The second is to populate that PVC with some source from some source. But simultaneously, we always knew that um, Kubernetes, this is a problem that a lot of people are gonna have in Kubernetes. So we, at that time, went to the SIG storage, uh, Kubernetes upstream community, and began a discussion for, you know, what's a generic solution for this? And actually someone from the Kubert CDI team was the first to propose a, uh, a cap for volume populators. Um, so data volumes were our thing we could do right away, yet we still wanted to participate in the community to have something upstream. 
be a fixed to more generic problem. Okay, so I mentioned the data volume has two jobs. Uh, the source section of the data volume spec specifies, you know, what we want on that PVC. Um, and in this case, we want to download a file that has uh, a Ceros image. We, did, we do a little more than simply downloading the file, um, but it's basically the idea. Um, there are other sources like importing from URL, importing from registry, cloning, uploading, blah, blah, blah. Okay, the PVC section specifies what uh, the PVC, the data bottom controller will create a PVC on your behalf. This is where you specify what you want it to look like, what, what are the parameters. Um, so the PVC section, spec.pvc is the precise configuration. You also have the spec.storage, which will do some defaulting for you uh, via storage profiles. Storage profiles are a convert that basically there's a storage profile for each storage class and will choose, say, the best access mode for you if you leave it out of your data volume spec. Um, so there's some defaulting done there. And it's kind of nice, um, you know, less things to know, the better. All right, and the data volume status. So I said the data volume has essentially two jobs and this is where you can track the status of those things. Um, so the phase is, um, you know, it succeeded when it's done. There are different phases based on the different source types. Um, progress, some source types will support an incremental uh, progress meter, um, not all of them. And uh, conditions are nice for working with kubectl uh, wait. So you can wait for the PVC to be bound, which is, you know, one of the first jobs of the data volume controller. And you can basically wait for uh, ready to be true. And that means that the day bomb is ready to use. And otherwise, the kind of opposite of that is this running condition where if that's true, it's not ready. OK, so we're going to go through what happens uh, when you create a data volume in a virtual machine instance. You know, um, you've posted these two manifests to a cluster. Um, what is going on behind the scenes? What is the synchronization? So at this point, you've just posted a data volume manifest and a virtual machine instance manifest. They're both pending. Next, uh, the data volume controller sees this uh, data volume manifest, and it will create a persistent volume claim per whatever you specified in the data volume. It will also create a worker pod that does handles the source uh, status, the source definition in the data volume. So in this case, this pod is going to connect to that URL and download a file and some stuff. So um, the data volume controller sees that, okay, I've created this PVC, I've created this pod and it's running, my phase is import in progress. So to a user that is watching this, they can see, oh, the import's in progress, you know, it's doing its work. The Vert controller doesn't really care about import and progress. It is still pending. It's waiting for data volumes to be complete before it does anything, um, before it can start running this virtual machine instance. OK, so once the import is complete, the pod is succeeded. Uh, the data volume sees that the pod succeeded, so it marks itself as succeeded. The vert controller sees that the data volume succeeded, so it will start a vert launcher pod, um, which I briefly talked about earlier, and that runs QMU. Um, so that pod will mount the PVC that has some freshly mounted data, freshly configured data. And now the virtual machine instance is scheduling. And finally, the virtual machine instance is running, the pod is running, and this is kind of the final state. Um, Couple, well, one thing, one important thing to note is that the data volume kind of has no, not much of a purpose at this point. Uh, it's done its job. Um, however, you can't delete it because it owns the PVC, which, um, you know, maybe it's fine. Maybe it's a bummer for some people, but that's the way it is right now. So that is kind of the flow of data populated with data volumes. I think that's most people maybe know this. Okay, so enter data, enter volume populators. So while we were 
using data volumes happily and uh, the community was slowly making progress on volume populators and we're finally there. Um, volume populators will be beta in Kubernetes 124. Previous versions can use the any volume data source feature gate. Um, populators will work best with CSI uh, PVCs because, well, if you're using a CSI PVC, you're probably using the CSI sidecars that are provided by um, the SIG storage. So they know how to deal with this data source ref, which is basically to do nothing. Um, other provisioners, you know, can handle it as well, but it's more likely to have luck with CSI volumes. And there is a pretty cool library called libvolumepopulator that makes it relatively easy to create controllers um, to uh, create your own populator. And I'll be showing a demo of using that uh, library to create essentially um, exactly what we did earlier with data volumes. OK, so yeah, what I'm going to show here is basically in a populator world, what we did with data volumes before. So this is the equivalent of the previous flow with, da with a data volume. You know, in a data volume, it was kind of one-stop shopping where you had one resource that had your PVC def and your source. With populators, it's a little different. So we create a PVC directly that has a data source ref uh, to this populator resource, you know, an API group populator, CDI.cubert.io import, zeros import. Um, so that's basically it. Uh, it may look a little weird to you. Data source ref doesn't a doesn't a PVC already have a data source field? And you are right. Uh, the data source field is currently used for creating a PVC from a volume snapshot or from another PVC. But uh, because of weird behavior that has been around for a while, um, essentially the CSI provisioner would ignore a data source that was not a volume snapshot or a persistent volume claim. So, and it would just provision the volume. And apparently some people in the world were taking advantage of that. And rather than um, make those people very unhappy, the decision was made to add this data source ref field instead and deprecate data source. So eventually, um, everything will be going through data source ref. OK, and this is the volume populator custom resource, which is essentially you could think of the store section of the data volume we saw earlier. Um, we're going to grab a file from a URL. There will be uh, different populator custom resources for import, clone, upload. OK, so this is the difference in the flow here. In this case, we're creating a PVC and a virtual machine instance that references that PVC. Uh, initially, everything is pending. Um, OK, so we've got a couple concurrent things going on here. So in namespace NS1, uh, the vert controller is going to start the vert launcher pod up right away. It, it, it has, it, as far as it's concerned, um, you know, it doesn't care that the PVC is pending. It, you know, does a lot of waiting for data volumes, but not for PVC. So it launches this vert launcher right away, but the pod is going to hang out for a while because the PVC is pending. In another namespace where our populator controller is running that we created with that lib populator, um, there are the running in this NS2 that is watching for PVCs that are getting created. And it sees this one, you know, and it will create a PVC called PVC1 prime. It looks just like PVC1, except it does not have the data source ref. So it should uh, bind right away. And we see that there is a, P a PV created up here. You know, every PVC has a, a PV, it's one-to-one -one relationship. The populated controller will also create this pod to do the population, which references the PVC, so that's running. 
So this is all happening in another namespace. Um, we're downloading a file, basically doing the same thing we're doing um, with data volumes, but kind of in, in another namespace. All right, eventually that pod will succeed. The population will finish. Um, the populator controller will set the PV to be retained and delete the PVC. We see no PVC here. There used to be a PVC here. So this PV is released. It's just kind of there. But the PV has the data that we populated. Um, the pod has succeeded. Um, so the next step is the populator controller will manually bind this PV to PVC1. Um, so PVC1 is now pointing to that PV1. And this is sort of the final state. So once that PVC becomes bound, the pod can become running, and now the virtual machine instance is running. So this is a much simpler flow from like for a controller side. It's just starting the pod up right away. Uh, it's letting the cube controller manager uh, wait for PVCs to be bound. It, it doesn't care that you know they're not bound. Like with the data volume case, it has to wait. All right. Um, so here is a demo. I'm going to have to um, share uh, the terminal. If you give me a minute. Okay, so you see a terminal, is it that is like readable? Okay, so, um, right. So we're gonna apply this manifest here. Uh, so in here, we've got a couple things. First is this, uh, this is the populator custom resource that we saw. Um, referencing the URL. Um, here is the PVC that is referencing that populator. And down here is a virtual machine instance that is referencing that PVC. And yeah, so this populator was created with that um, library. Uh, and let's see if it works. Uh, and these other consoles over here will watch PVCs. Uh, there's no PVCs. And down here, we'll watch MIs. And we'll create the VM, the CML here. Okay, so we should, OK, we see a PVC is pending. We see the VM is scheduling. Um, what we'd like to see next is this PVC gets bound. OK, now we see the PVC is bound and the VM is scheduling. Let's um, hopefully the, the VM VMI should start running soon. It's still scheduling. OK, it's scheduled. And now we see it booting in the other terminal there. So Populators are ready to use now. Um, you should check them out. That, this demo is actually quite easy to put together. All right, so now you may be thinking, um, wow, OK, we've got data volumes, we've got populators. That's two ways to do the same thing. That's typically not a great place to be <laughs> in software engineering. So let's, this is where I want, you know, the community and to get together to maybe help. Oh, let me stop sharing. Let me go back to my slides. Okay. So, yeah. So, we've got these two ways of doing the same thing, or, well, very similar things. So, Let's talk about the pros and cons and the path forward. Hopefully, um, we'd like to get some input from the community. Um, so the way I see it, um, with data volumes, we've got this nice storage profile integration that I mentioned earlier with you know, 
Um, you don't have to specify every parameter of a PVC. It's also really nice status reporting. Basically, with the PVC, you know, PVC status is basically it, it, a boolean that's either it's bound or it's not. There are no conditions. There's not much there. So, um, with populators supporting something like a percentage progress, um, we've got to think about. And yeah, similarly, data volumes have these conditions, which are nice. But there are some cons with data volumes. Um, that whole synchronization step um, is a bit of a bummer. And I didn't even get into the weight handling weight for first consumer, which is pretty much a presentation on its own. <laughs> um, it's very complicated. Uh, it involves creating like weird doppelganger pods and it, it it works but it's a little clunky and um well not ideal um as i mentioned before uh data volumes can't be deleted once they're created otherwise that will take the pvc with it and they're tricky to back up and restore um you know right now we're talking to backup integrators and you know we a lot of the work is around um, handling and, and the right way to make them restore correctly. Um, we wrote a custom Valero plugin for this, for example, and it's basically about managing data volumes. So volume populators, the pros, community standard. Um, we finally got here. It's been a long road, but uh, it's nice that we're here. You can create your own populator using that library pretty easily. Let's say, for example, you have disk images and BitTorrent that you want to download, write your own populator, um, or you know you can use it right away like I just did. And I think the shared configuration is kind of a nice thing. Basically, rather than having a URL and, and 100 different resources, you have a URL in one place and reference that resource that has the URL. Uh, the cons, minimal status, and uh, as I said earlier, not all provisioners uh, will work with populators just yet. Um, I think that will change, but um, I think like for, for example, like local storage provisioner, I don't think works right. So what's coming up? Um, the Kubert CDI team plans to release populators for each of the existing data volume sources. Um, we hope you build your own populators. We'd love to hear about uh, Kubert populators being uh, distributed in the wild. That would be great. Um, and the data volume controller will be up updated to use populators internally. The timing on that may be a little weird because, um, because well, not all provisioners, I think all of our supporter provisioners necessarily will work with populators just yet. But that will, I'm sure, will change eventually. So. This is where we kind of want to discuss with the community. You know, we've got these two, we've got populators, we've got data volumes, where do we wanna go? Um, is there still value in data volumes? Um, should we tweak them a little bit? Maybe that owner reference thing, um, you know, maybe you should be able to delete a data volume once it's been populated, stuff like that. Uh, maybe we should have some new resource um, as a data volume replacement. Or maybe we'll just get rid of them, but you know that may be difficult because, um, well, for one reason, data volumes specs are part of VM specs in the data volume template section, so that could be quite quite a. It'd be hard to get rid of them, but um, this is where we want to talk about you know what um, where do we want to go as a community with data volumes and populators? Uh, I think that the populators solve a lot of the nice techno technical challenges like way for first consumer. Um, and I think the back they're you know, easier to back up. Um, so I think there's a, got a lot going for them, but you know, there's still some things that data volumes provide that you know, we potentially have to figure out what to do. Uh, maybe we can go back to the community and, and ask for, we need some status support. I don't know, but you know, I, I hope we can work together. I'm going to probably send something out to the Kubert dev mailing list, talk about it in our um, weekly meetings. But 
you know, um, love to get your feedback. All right. Uh, any questions or feedback on anything that was discussed? Thank you, Michael, for the very interesting talk. Um, you know, I I was very, you know, surprised with that. It was very interesting, especially for, you know, performance standpoint that you you create, you know, the virtual launcher pod for and you let all the, the containers be initialized that I showed in my previous presentation that it can take a lot of time. And yeah. if you can do that in parallel, it's awesome. So it's very interesting. So let's see that we have some questions here. Um, so Daniel asked, what other protocols are supported for volume of populators besides HTTP? So uh, I, I guess for official kubevert, you know, data volumes will support uh, HTTP as well as, um, I guess, registry import. So you can import a, um, a disk image that is in a container registry. Um, but there, there's really, you know, there's no limit to what, uh, you know, you can do whatever you, whatever you can do in a pod and write to a PVC. Um, but I think, you know, we're going to support everything we do now, which is basically importing from a registry, um, uploading from your desktop, copying other PVCs. Okay. Um, so Jennifer also asked a question. If the volumes went away, what would a clone workflow look like? Uh, create PVC uh, with uh, volume populator source, creates volume snapshot in a new PVC reference, the snapshot. Yeah, so this this gets back to some, uh, at the same time we started talking volume populators with the community, we started talking um, namespace transfer. Um, and the volume populator has progressed, um, you know, it progressed, it took three years, but we got here. Unfortunately, um, the whole namespace transfer thing uh, is still um, under discussion and, and there's not a consensus there. So there will be a, um, a clone populator and I think it will work pretty much exactly like data volume, the existing data volume populator that will do all the snapshot stuff under the covers. Um, so that that will be there. Um, some of the authentication stuff will change a little bit. Like now, if you're cloning between namespaces, we do um, weird auth checks, but we're going to have an alternative way of doing that. Um, so uh, the short answer is that um, there will be a clone populator, but uh, if you want to use the sort of Kubernetes primitives, that, that's fine too. Okay. So any other question? Okay, don't seem so now. So Michael, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting again. Okay. Okay. No, no question. <laughs> thank and you. Thank you.